Thank you all for coming. Uh, my name is Jennifer Romanchek, and I am a member of the exhibitions team here at Brand Library Art Center. Art Talk Tuesdays is an initiative of the brand in which we invite contemporary artists from the Glendale and greater Los Angeles area to discuss their work and the issues that surround it, followed by a moderated discussion with myself and a public Q&A. This program is free and open to the public. I would like to take a moment to thank my many team members who help support this program, Kaylee Cannon, Chloe Kors, Stacey London, Stephanie Sherwood, and Blair Whittington. Ian James is an artist who primarily works in photography. Interested in the metaphysics of objects, James restages New Age healing and healing device advertising and places these images in relation to one another atop laminate panels. These images indicate how a device should be placed on the body and how one should feel once the device is in use. In addition, James has been making pilgrimages to photograph pyramid architecture throughout North America and Europe as a form of late capitalist pilgrimage. The images he makes become a material substance for cast frameworks, assemblages, sculptures, books, videos, a radio station, and a virtual reality environment. James has presented solo exhibitions at Five Car Garage, The Fulcrum, Hernando's Hideaway in Miami, Vacancy, and Self-Actualization in Houston, as well as group exhibitions at the Indianapolis Museum of Contemporary Art, the UNLV Barrick Museum, Roberts Projects, Red Cat, and Holiday Forever in Jackson, Wyoming, among others. He was an artist in residence at SIM in Iceland and the Waisei Project in New York. He has an upcoming monograph to be published with the Fulcrum Press. His work is held in the permanent collection at LACMA, and he is an adjunct professor at Otis College of Art and Design, Art Center, and Pasadena City College. Please join me in welcoming Ann James. Hi, everybody. Um, thank you for coming. Thank you to uh, Jennifer for the invitation and for the Brand Library for uh, hosting, and for uh, Stephanie, who I just met, for also all of her help. Um, it's great to see so many friendly faces. Um, so I'm going to actually start with a short video. Uh, so let me just pop over to YouTube for a second here. Okay. Uh, so to preface this, we're just going to watch about um, let me know if I'm too close, too far away from this, or it's not even needed, I don't know. Um, just a short uh, minute or two of this. This video is called the uh, Sedona the Psychic Vortex Experience, and it is a uh, video produced in 1985 by Valley of the Sun, which is a, uh, was a record company and publishing company based in Malibu and later in Sedona, Arizona. <laughs> Once you've done this, one of the things that I like to do is to test the energy. I don't do it anymore, but I did it initially. And one of the best ways to do this, you don't even really have to be in, a, in an altered state of consciousness, especially if you're at Airport Mesa, to do this, but it's more powerful this way. Hold your hands out towards the vortex area, aimed at the vortex area. In other words, sit up on the edge, around the edge of the vortex somewhere. And Remember, we're not looking for a great indention in the ground with a sign that says vortex. We're, we're only looking for natural countryside around here as we describe it on these instruction sheets. But hold your hands up and just concentrate and see what you feel coming against the palms of your hands. And then turn around and face the other way and hold your hands out and see if you feel the same thing. I contend you won't. You'll feel the force of the vortex when you're facing the vortex. You move away from the vortex, you will not. Now this will work at especially well at Airport Mesa. It will work to a little lesser degree at Courthouse Rock or at Bell Rock. But you're going to have to just be away from the vortex a little ways to do it there, and then, then turn. It will not work. So in this video, uh, Dick Sutphin, who created Valley of the Sun, um, is leading this seminar, and he would lead these seminars in Sedona, Arizona, where he essentially would um, talk about basically uh, growing or strengthening psychic powers. 
uh, and he would do this to a kind of audience in a convention hall setting and um, would also sort of lead people through uh, the types of experiences they would have walking around the vortexes in Sedona, of which there are four. Uh, so it was this kind of two tandem thing of sort of talking about the vortexes as well as uh, how to grow your psychic powers and sort of one hopefully leading to the other. Um, so let me go back over here in the PowerPoint. There, okay. There we go, okay, cool. There was two windows open at the same plot. Okay, um, so the work I've been making, uh, I kind of date it back to say around 2013, and it has a lot to do with this radio show that I was doing um, on K-Chung, and a lot of you guys are probably familiar with some people here who uh, have been involved in K-Chung and also uh, did shows on K-Chung, and I was doing a show on K-Chung called Healing Light Comfort Zone, and that was about um, three years out of uh, graduate school, and, uh, and the show was about New Age music primarily um, from the late 1970s until the 1990s. And most of this music was made here in the United States, uh, though some was made in uh, Europe and also in, in Japan. And this sort of scene, which has now been kind of thought of as a um, new type of, or new kind of subgenre of American folk music, uh, was never super prominent. Uh, and so the sort of benefit of that for me, and I had come from a journalism background from my undergraduate, uh, was that I could essentially reach out and ask people that were part of this movement. Um, and I started having them on the show and interviewing them. Uh, this is a uh, still image from um, the live action TV version of Healing Light Comfort Zone, which this is with my co-host Meredith Carter and I. Uh, and we um, basically had a few of these musicians. This is Cat Ebel pictured uh, here. And we basically had them sort of Skype into this kind of variety show that we were doing. So this is Cat Ebel demonstrating these collection of flutes that she had. Uh, we also had Yasos, who's a kind of new age luminary, and JD Manuel. And these were people that I was kind of meeting through doing the show. Uh, and basically learning kind of more about their lives and why they started creating the music they were creating, um, their sort of spiritual practices, which are oftentimes kind of cobbled together from uh, various sort of like Eastern practices and esoteric practices and old sort of ancient indigenous practices, as well as a sort of like technological component. Um, and I was also collecting a lot of this ephemera related to uh, this movement, uh, cassette tapes and, and records. Uh, so there's a few of these. Um, and I think my background in uh, conceptual art and in um, basically kind of thinking about structuralism and post-structuralism and the sort of codes that make up an image, became really intrigued about sort of picking apart some of these pictures, particularly those that were picturing uh, the musicians or related people and this sort of like affect of looking wise or looking knowing or looking um, the part of if you know you uh, listen to this cassette tape, you're going to feel the way the person pictured on the cover does, and that was really intriguing to me. Um, there was a lot of recurring pyramid motifs, uh, and also, of course, a lot of meditation and yoga and that sort of thing. Um, I also, as part of working on this kind of project, and I was essentially just kind of assembling like an image archive. I was collecting a lot of these pictures that we're kind of looking at uh, through just internet searches as well as scanning them from books and buying old uh, sort of metaphysical magazines and that kind of thing. Uh, and I started building out this image archive, which I'm still sort of doing to this day. It has, you know, I think probably 2,000 or so images in it. Um, and so as I started kind of, this is a, uh, so to walk you through these devices, this one is a hand massager. This is a neck traction device that you uh, inflate. Uh, this one I particularly think is incredible as an early uh, Amazon Echo, which not only is a smart speaker, but it also uh, would emit heat and vibrate. It had these various kind of settings and all the advertising for it always had people like clutching it very uh, intently, kind of like you might clutch a small child or a cat or something. Uh, <laughs> And so as part of kind of thinking about these pictures, I started to envision this um, way that I would kind of contribute to the archive myself, essentially through restaging the pictures, through shooting new portraits, sometimes inspired by uh, the photographs I was collecting, uh, before um, 
Before graduate school, I worked at Getty Images, and at Getty Images, I worked in the sort of stock photography generation department. And one of the things we were doing is we were always sort of updating previous images from the collection to new kind of like trends and colors and standards and uh, that kind of thing. And so this idea of a never, uh, a never fully fulfilled kind of image archive was something that was really exciting to me. So I started making these um, portraits initially. I was interviewing um, some of these kind of new age luminaries. This is Yasos, who uh, lives in Marin County. And so I went up for a weekend and uh, interviewed him and hung out at his house for a day. And also saw friends and did other sort of related trips to this project there. But hung out with him for a day and uh, shot this portrait of him in his bedroom uh, in Marin County. Uh, the man we saw earlier in the conference center video uh, talking about Vortexes, uh, Dick Sutphin, this is a photograph I made of him in Sedona, uh, and he is in his YouTube broadcasting studio, which is in a side bedroom of his house, and he had this printed vinyl uh, Sedona Vortex behind him, which was kind of amazing because you walk out of his house and the exact Vortex was actually there. <laughs> Uh, this is J.D. Emanuel in his uh, studio in uh, Houston, Texas. Uh, and so I was making some of these pictures, and I also started uh, restaging synthesizer advertisements. And so this is a restaged image of an Ensonic Mirage uh, synthesizer advertisement that came out of a keyboard magazine from the mid-80s. So I found, I basically at the beginning of this project would find friends and um, try to kind of match the image to a certain degree, but also allow the failures and like the inability to, to match the image be kind of part of the uh, process. Uh, this is another image from that um, sort of project. This is a restaged image from an ARP synthesizer ad that had been like in the back of a uh, keyboard magazine for basically mail ordering ARP synthesizer. And the synthesizer became this like really like important touchstone for me in kind of thinking through this project. As someone that's like made their artwork and had a kind of close relationship with cameras and printers my whole life and has sort of felt like I'm having this kind of literal relationship with another kind of being, um, this thing that Yasos had said to me when I was interviewing him is he was talking about these two interdimensional beings that he has been in touch with since he was a grad student in the jazz department at Stanford in the late 60s. And they were essentially telling him about this music that they wanted him to make and the music was supposed to help with uh, human beings kind of ascending to a higher plane of existence and he couldn't figure out how to make the music happen until the advent of like the commercially available there we go there we go the commercially available synthesizer um, and once that synthesizer sort of came into being and he could afford it and get one and this is like in the mid to late 1970s um, he was able to kind of produce this music that he was hearing from these interdimensional beings who were instructing him to do this task and so it was kind of this exciting thing for me to kind of think about because he's essentially sort of talking about a piece of consumer electronics that's essentially becoming an interdimensional energetic channel to, you know, higher beings in other dimensions. Um, and so I had been thinking about that sort of line of thinking and thinking about Jane Bennett's Vibrant Matter, where she's sort of talking about the possibility of consciousness existing within electricity and that there's this universal, thus, consciousness through electricity. Um, there was another book that was kind of important to this sort of growing project by uh, Wan Young Kim, where she talks about uh, consciousness existing on electrons and that electrons uh, thus being kind of engaged with like the production of electricity, uh, as well as being involved in all matter in the universe, essentially it produces a sort of universal consciousness. And so thinking about that line of thinking, but then thinking how it sort of exists through cameras and printers and um, synthesizers in this case is all kind of like this under thread running through all of this. Uh, this is another restaged image of a uh, cassette tape we saw earlier, uh, the Upper Astral Suite, which was a um, an album by Upper Astral that came out on Valley of the Sun. These are uh, some meditation goggles, and again, these are all images that I have produced uh, that are sort of restaged from pre-existing advertising and instruction manual images, which. Sometimes people get confused about, which is also like kind of exciting that that confusion <laughs> happens because <laughs> I feel like I'm, you know, sort of falling into the photographic kind of slipstream. Um, this is a, a slider phone um, floating in some reeds. And then the way I tend to work is I tend to make a sort of body of, of photographs without really knowing how they're meant to exist. 
kind of basically generating material, almost like producing my own pigments, but in this case it's like producing my own uh, photographs, then sort of decide how they should live. Um, and this was a two-person show in uh, Jackson, Wyoming, at a place, a uh, sort of artist-run gallery called Holiday Forever, run by um, an artist named Andy Kincaid. And so this was kind of the first sort of concerted way of kind of thinking about these pictures as material. Um, the images live inside these frames, and there are these retail-type shelves that protrude from the front. Uh, and then there is this uh, sandstone uh, wallpaper or kind of paneling that is behind. Um, sitting on the uh, shelves are these various sort of objects of kind of like esoteric significance. Some kind of personal to me and others sort of like for uh, calibrating a monitor. Uh, I think there was some melatonin on here. Um, this little blue thing is a uh, massager you're meant to warm up in the microwave and rub on yourself. Um, and then about eight months after, um, I did a solo show at uh, Vacancy, which is a space here that many of you may know that was in MacArthur Park for three years, um, run by uh, Chris Adler and Ali Edmark. And uh, this show was called Time in the Technosphere. And there was a mixture of these restaged device photographs uh, in the show, as well as um, these kind of sculptures. And I tend to always kind of think about a show um, essentially as one kind of body, or one sort of work, and the work is then uh, made of these kind of constituent parts that all kind of peel off and could be individual works, but are all meant to kind of interlock and perform the duty of making sort of one sort of, um, you know, work that is the exhibition. And um, for this project I just cast, I started casting people from um, sort of actors and model uh, casting websites. And I just used the same person for all these photographs, and um, I continued using this sandstone graffiti. And these sandstone graffiti uh, panels, essentially it's a custom laminate that um, is produced from uh, a laminate company. And I essentially gave them 35 millimeter film scans of sandstone graffiti from Arches National Park near, uh, near Delicate Arch. And I was particularly very much um, influenced and still to this day am of the writings of Phil Kluser. And this location where the sandstone graffiti was happening was really exciting to me because it was this like place where the image and the technical image that Phil Kluser writes about kind of would get compressed. These people, tourists, were using you know simple things, probably old keys and whatnot, to carve into sandstone and write their initials or their tag or you know who they're in love with, that kind of thing. And then meanwhile, we're also making tourist snapshots of themselves, of each other, um, that kind of thing. And so it was this like compression of those two types of uh, image making of the hand directly to the surface in the case of Flusser's ideas around the image, and then the uh, technical image where they're using a, a black box and apparatus to render a picture. Um, and in sort of Flusser's sense, he sort of talks about it in a uh, Marxist discourse kind of way where he's essentially talking about people not knowing how cameras essentially function, so you wind up bending your body and contorting yourself and flipping it this way and that way and sort of playing with the settings in order to try to get the spit out images that you like. So he talks about how people essentially are functionaries or operators of these devices, almost like someone running like a lathe or something in a factory. So there's some details. The um, pieces in the show also had some of these uh, acrylic shelves protruding from the image surface. Um, but I left them empty in this case. I've been going to so many display stores to do research in uh, South Downtown and became really interested in the sort of possibility for them to hold an object. Uh, and some of the shelves were placed at angles so that they would um, sort of fail at that possibility. There were also uh, some sculptures that I made in the show. There were these uh, stainless steel welded armatures that essentially were meant to be these kind of overwrought museum or uh, luxury, art, uh, luxury object armatures, and they were essentially displaying uh, some of the devices that had been photographed and were in the exhibition's photographs. Uh, this is a hydrology mask here. Uh, the other one we just saw is a sort of electro stimulator. It's meant to kind of uh, lightly electrocute you and stimulate your muscles. There were also these magazine racks that were uh, operating as assemblages of collected, kind of again, um, 
collected objects that I have been sort of assembling. Some of them are uh, slag from a uh, closed ceramic foundry that used to exist uh, at this residency I went to in upstate New York. Others were plant matter, uh, and then there was also this banner. Uh, and then the final sort of piece of the show was this calendar. And the show, I don't know if I said what the title was, the show was called Time and the Technosphere. And as I was kind of working on this work, I had uh, gone across the street uh, to the last bookstore at one point and got this book. I just, I found it just while kind of browsing. Uh, and it was by a writer named Jose Arguelles, uh, who wrote extensively about technology and metaphysics. And um, he was very much interested in this idea of calendar reform and particularly thought that human beings in our sort of calendars and the way we measure time and the way we sort of um, lay out sort of our years and all this kind of thing were essentially working uh, in, con in contrast, I guess, working against the natural rhythms of the earth and um, the solar system and the moon and um, the larger sort of universe. And he thought this was causing human beings all of these problems and that as a result of this, we were inventing all these technologies to try to fix the problems and then this was becoming kind of a feedback loop that then was producing more sort of issues, um, so on and so forth. And my, one of my interests kind of in the device work was essentially kind of thinking about why all of these images, or sorry, these devices were meant to be um, sort of slotted into this kind of like new age kind of metaphysical healing technology, the thing that they were trying to heal you from were the maladies of like late capitalism, of dealing with like polluted water, polluted air, uh, long working hours, all the sort of stresses of uh, being alive. And so that these devices were sort of meant to be these kind of recovery sort of objects trying to prepare you to put you back to some form of, uh, you know, sort of ability to go back in and fight another day. And so, I was feeling like he and I were kind of coming at this idea from different places, and that was really exciting to me. He also, um, his ideas, and I'm like very much oversimplifying uh, what he is into, um, but he would very much illustrate his ideas with lots of graphs and charts um, to try to express them, and I saw a lot of artistry in how he was doing that, and that was really exciting to me. Um, and so to go back to the calendar, uh, the calendar essentially, and I very much like to think about how to extend the life of an exhibition. An exhibition often is, you know, four or five weeks, um, and then it's over. And I like to kind of think about making some form of almost like residue from an exhibition, almost kind of like if you're leaving the show and you like step in some mud and then like it gets inside your car afterwards. It's like, oh, this becomes a sort of like residue of my experience of going to the show. Kind of thinking about like, things that sort of spiral out of a show like that. And so this calendar is meant to do that. Um, and there was writing uh, starting on the 10th of December, 2016, that then followed for the next uh, 355 days or whatever. It ran until the end of November, 2017. And it was one line per day that basically fulfilled an entire chapter of one of, of time in the technosphere where he's essentially kind of talking about these preliminary ideas around calendar reform. So it became this way to sort of deal with the research for the show, uh, also provide this like sort of like functional thing to people that they would sort of pull out of the show, but also make the thing kind of a failure too because most people like to write, you know, what days they're going to the dentist or like picking up their kid or whatever from school. and. There was essentially no room to write anything, and also the the calendar ends uh, at the end of November 2017, essentially leaving you potentially without a month in the calendar. Um, so those kind of failures were exciting, and also a way to kind of help people understand where the show is coming from. Uh, and then to jump ahead a little bit, this is a show that um, I think people, a number of people in this room probably saw. Uh, at Five Car Garage, which is now, um, I think it is now back to calling it uh, Emma Gray's HQ. But same place, uh, a gallery, kind of a eastern edge of Santa Monica, uh, run out of a former Five Car Garage by Emma Gray. And um, the show, this was during COVID, and uh, I was lucky enough to kind of have a few projects get lined up, and then COVID happened, and we pushed the projects back, because I'm sure many people in this room also had this experience. Uh, pushed the projects back, and then COVID obviously kept happening, and so then we just went ahead and did it. 
Um, and so in this exhibition, which is called Harmony of the Newosphere, um, I was wanting to make some evolved versions of these panel pieces. Um, but I also, in kind of thinking about these devices that I was encountering, the um, you know, hand massagers, but also kind of meditation devices and other things, and I had gone to this um, monastery up in Northern California called the Buddha Maitreya, the Christ Shambhala Monastery, and this was a place where they were actually making their own spiritual technologies, things essentially to help you meditate or help sort of cure kind of bodily disorders and this kind of thing. Uh, and so I've been thinking about a radio station primarily because a lot of this work originated from doing the radio show and I'd even prior to Keichung had a history in doing uh, a college radio show when I was an undergrad. Um, and so it kind of felt like making a radio station was the right first stab at making a sort of metaphysical piece of technology. Uh, so I built this during COVID. Uh, it is a 2000 watt uh, FM radio station. The uh, FM transmitter actually came from Wuhan, China. And the, uh, I think I ordered it in March 2020. and was going back and forth with the uh, guy, the guy that runs the factory in, in Wuhan. Um, and it was during that time period of COVID where you couldn't get any toilet paper. And so instead of using bubble wrap and like packing peanuts, he packed the transmitter with uh, toilet paper rolls, which is pretty wild. Uh, and then there's also a uh, amplifier and a mixer. Uh, and then there is the uh, antenna, which is here. Uh, we were broadcasting throughout the run of the show that we kept it on the lower side of the uh, spectrum, basically because Five Car Garage is near an uh, airport. And the military and the airport authorities get really upset if you're illegally broadcasting near an airport. <laughs> <laughs> so we kept it at 10 watts, but at 2,000 watts, uh, it essentially can broadcast, it depends on line of sight, but it can broadcast 30 miles. Um, it's a highly pirate, pirate new age radio station. Uh, the things that were being broadcast on it uh, were this collection of, of basically long form new age music that I had been collecting while doing the, the radio show and stuff that people had sent me and this kind of thing. A lot of tracks that are very sort of like droney and for the purposes of meditation um, uh, that are you know anywhere from 30 minutes to an hour each. Um, and the, like I said, the show is called The Harmony of the Newosphere. This is an image, and again, like after the previous show, I showed basically I had been finding ways to kind of integrate or implicate Jose Arguelles and all the work I've been making in one form or another. And so this is an image that he had made. It's of the Earth with uh, the magnetosphere going around it. But the magnetosphere is a rainbow, and he was theorizing this idea of the newosphere and. This, idea comes from uh, people preceding him, from Pierre Teilhard de Chardin, who was a Jesuit priest. Uh, he was actually the first like Catholic priest to go to China in the 1890s or something like that. Uh, and then also uh, Vladimir Vernadsky, who was a Russian biocosmist. Cosmist. Uh, and both of them were sort of talking about this idea of human consciousness ascending to such a degree that it would create this telepathic sphere. Um, that would encircle the globe and allow for a more sort of like perfect ability for human beings to communicate with each other, uh, which I thought was really interesting as someone that um, was in grad school and reading De Saussure and thinking about uh, the failures of language and the imperfect language and uh, communication capabilities of human beings, this idea of a telepathic sphere where we can more purely express our thoughts to each other is really exciting. Um, this book I was reading of Jose Arguelles at the time was called Manifesto for the Newosphere. Uh, and so the show uh, implicated some of that writing and also that graphic. Uh, and then these were some of the panels that I was making, um, some of these panel works that I was making for the show. Um, some of these images were images that I was making, uh, but I also began integrating some of this archive material that I had been collecting for a long time. So um, sort of putting them all in kind of a mix with each other. And um, the laminate change, these are also laminate panels, but this laminate is a Calicata marble, and it's uh, obviously a reproduction of the original marble, but Calicata marble comes from these particular quarries in Italy, and there's some of the oldest marble quarries in the world. So that became sort of symbol symbolically important to me of thinking about, again, a sort of like, um, way to assign kind of value to a material. This marble, as a result, has been in 
um, important sort of like architecture of governance and uh, spiritual and kind of like religious importance since you know antiquity to thinking about how marble becomes this sort of like value order for that or this particular marble. <coughs> It's also integrating some of these uh, engraved brass, 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 <laughs> plaques. Uh, and some of these had um, graphics that came from Argoyas as well, referring to human ascension. Um, as part of building a radio station, um, I had this thing in my mind, it's again kind of a silly joke along the lines of some of the things integrated into the calendar, of basically thinking about public radio tchotchkes, thinking about the pledge drives that radio stations do, that KXLU does, uh, basically what it takes to get a tote bag or an embroidered hat or something like that, um, a bumper sticker. And so I made these, and again kind of thinking along the lines of uh, these sort of residues from exhibitions, I made these uh, enamel coins that are about two, one, one and three quarters inches in diameter. Uh, and you could buy one of these coins from the exhibition uh, to use to contribute to the growth of the radio station. And the radio station, um, the sort of like version two of it is for it to go in this renovated travel trailer that is currently out on the high desert, but will allow it to sort of travel around and uh, ideally elude authorities. Um, and so you could buy one of these coins that came in this little coin box then you also could um, drop one of these coins into this sculpture. And so it was kind of like to obtain a coin was to contribute to like the next uh, lifespan of the radio station as well as to uh, complete this um, sculpture that I had, which was kind of like a dumb sort of like charitable coin drop that I had uh, taken apart and uh, put back together. Uh, the next project I did during um, COVID was in Miami, Florida, Miami Beach, with Gladys Hernando, who was a curator that used to live here and is one of the founders of Joan. Um, she had moved back and has been doing these projects uh, in her domestic space. Uh, the space is called Hernando's Hideaway, and I did this show with her called Untying Six Astral Knots. Um, really interested in kind of thinking about how again, like images are elastic. And so in the case of this image here, you don't really see my cursor, do you? Um, in case of that image, that image there, it had sort of shown up in a previous work and I'm kind of interested in how things kind of like have a seepage, how images don't really ever have a set form because of their elasticity and because of the ways that we can sort of like treat them in space and this infinite kind of myriad of possibilities. And so Miami being kind of in Hurricane Alley and it being very rainy and windy all the time, I wanted to make these sort of like spinning kind of photographs. So these were these uh, stretched versions of this uh, pre-existing picture put inside this um, kind of stainless steel crescent and then when it was windy they would spin. Uh, there was also this um, print on the front of the house that was an image that came from Yasos that he had shot in a uh, like New Age crystal store or something like that in the early 90s. I feel like it was like 32 kilobytes and I expanded it to be five by 10 feet or something like that. Um, and then there was also, which then just got like the fractal kind of pixel chunks really just became um, really beautiful. Uh, and then there was another uh, plaque from him uh, of the radial five dimensional being. And this show I mentioned was called Untying uh, Six Astral Knots. Um, the sort of final component were these plaques that I made. Uh, and the plaques were just kind of installed sort of throughout the site and were meant to be kind of integrated with the architecture and with the, um, the plants that were growing, essentially to kind of be these things that are sort of almost getting jammed into the uh, crevices of the home, letting the house in some ways kind of over-determine or overcoat them. Uh, and they were these photos that I was making of, you know, it's really kind of silly, like these starburst patterns through a star filter. And so I was shooting them with my 35 millimeter camera with like a long telephoto lens and a star filter so the star filter burst would be uh, really prominent in the image, really just sort of overpower what was behind it. Uh, and then there was a bit of text underneath each one um, that came from the meditation. 
Uh, so this says love is an unconditional response to the world. This one uh, says purification, healing as a gift of our own being. This one in the carport says memory as the recollection of original cosmic nature. I know this is in the carport, that other one was by the pool. Uh, intelligence is our intrinsic curiosity and knowing. Flowering is our expression of radiance. And uh, meditation is a gift for having a clear mind. And one of the kind of things I was sort of interested in in making these sort of starburst pictures, and it kind of almost relates to thinking about a uh, piece of uh, consumer electronics, you know, something that's in some ways highly disposable, uh, having a metaphysic to it, having like a connection to the divine, um, and thinking about these kind of like starburst patterns was essentially, I was trying to think about this very banal existence of consciousness or the divine kind of, you know, surrounding us. Um, this is uh, the kind of third, third chapter in my, my COVID exhibition history. Um, this is a show I did uh, at the Fulcrum, which is in Chinatown. Again, maybe a few of you guys are familiar with it. Um, and the show was called Ur Temple, all capitalized UR-Temple. Um, and while this work was very attached to um, the previous work in a way, and that was on purpose, it also branched out from it in some ways, um, mainly because during uh, COVID, about eight months prior to this, this is late 2021, my partner and I had a daughter. Um, and we had a daughter while living in uh, Joshua Tree, uh, while teaching remote, and while not really seeing anybody. We had her out there, and we didn't have family here, and so it was a very like amazing, but also kind of isolating situation. We also didn't um, uh, didn't really stop working while we were had had her. Uh, we're still sort of like teaching online and. That certainly made it uh, doable to do that kind of thing, um, but it led me to thinking, you know, more fully about the difficulties of having a child in our sort of culture and society, and all the um, sort of roadblocks and uh, obstructions to sort of doing it without going completely insane. Um, this is a wall print, a full wall print of the uh, GSA building, which is in Sacramento. It's a pyramid building and. Um, maybe many of you know I have this uh, side of my practice that involves making photographs of pyramids. Um, this is one of those images, but it was also kind of chosen because it felt like this locator. Uh, the GSA is the General Services Administration, and they basically handle appropriations for uh, the state of California in this case. And so I sort of saw them as a kind of locator for the, um, the problems we were having as far as uh, having a child. Um, there were also these panel pieces that I made. Um, I'd begun experimenting with casting frames in aluminum, frames in map board. Uh, and I also, um, as part of this archive that I, you know, I've mentioned before that I had of these sort of health and healing devices, had a number of images in that archive that related to uh, either prenatal or postnatal um, technologies. So breast pumps, for example, uh, Doppler, heart monitors, um, and so it felt like this weird way that the technology or this sort of project had kind of caught up with me uh, in this unexpected way, and so I restaged some of these uh, instruction manual images and advertising uh, images, um, and they essentially sat inside these aluminum frames that I was having cast. The aluminum frames had really started from this space of kind of thinking about modernist presentations of, of photographs, thinking about um, going to the Getty or going to the Met and seeing minor white images and seeing images set into these kind of deep eight-ply mat boards um, with these wooden frames around it. And so I started making some of those and didn't feel entirely satisfied with them um, and how I was then putting my own photographs in them. So I wound up, I was having other things cast at an aluminum foundry and started just taking the mat boards and the frames to the foundry. And due to the thinness of both of the materials, uh, essentially these spillages would happen uh, around the edges. And so the thing that became really kind of exciting was sort of thinking about the sort of Walter Benjamin kind of uh, art in the age of mechanical reproduction where these images wind up being 
um, completely infinitely reproducible, but then these frames, which you know, the frame is meant to be this sort of neutral space, it's meant to kind of fall away and kind of disappear, uh, wound up being this space for autonomy or a space for a kind of like unique idiosyncrasy of the work. Uh, there was also a uh, VR environment that was in the show. Um, I was going to show a little bit about of that, but I felt like, uh-oh, there we go. <laughs> I felt like there wasn't enough time. Uh, but if anyone ever wants to see uh, some screen capture of that, uh, I can send it to you. But essentially, it uh, allowed you to kind of walk through this uh, archive of images I was referencing, or have been referencing. I also made another coin. And um, I really enjoyed making the coins for the previous uh, exhibition. And so in talking to uh, Josh Shadle and Wyatt Conlon, who run the Fulcrum, um, we were sort of trying to game out what a coin for the show might be and why. And I couldn't just like make a coin for no purpose. It had to have some reason to exist in my art brain. Uh, and so I found out through them that they had a difficulty getting bathroom tokens uh, for the shared bathroom that they're in in the sort of plaza they're in in Chinatown. Uh, so we wound up getting a very exacting caliper and measuring the bathroom tokens that came from their landlord. And then I found a, a sort of private minting service that happened to be my hometown of Cincinnati that would make the, uh, the coins. So we made them in an addition of 3,000, which was the lowest number we could make. Uh, the minting uh, place usually makes them, you know, for longer mats and for arcades and that kind of thing. Uh, and then the uh, other side of my practice that's been really kind of important to me um, has been this thing that also kind of came out of the radio show and also came out of all this kind of collecting of these new age kind of cultural artifacts. Uh, again, I kind of mentioned when we were looking at some of the cassette tape images earlier, this recurring motif of the pyramid. Um, and I was originally home visiting uh, family uh, in around sort of Christmas time, like 2015, I think it was and started just spending my, you know, bored kind of holiday free time trying to find out if there were uh, pyramids in the U.S. And there are some um, pyramids that relate back to indigenous um, tribal cultures. There's Cahokia, for example, which is near um, St. Louis. I was kind of very interested in the possibilities for, for new pyramids, for thinking about where this sort of form had um, been taken from antiquity in this very sort of Las Vegas kind of way and emptied out and then uh, reformatted in this you know sort of American kind of hegemonic um, sort of uh, cultural uh, production kind of facet. Uh, and this is the first one I had had photographed on that sort of Cincinnati trip. This is north of Indianapolis. It's a um, office park by some architects. Uh, it was built in the 1970s, uh, who later went on to win a Pritzker Prize, but not for this. Uh, and I really thought it was going to be a one-off photograph. And as I started to do more research and kind of enjoy the process, um, one kind of turned into the next and to the next. This is the Bass Pro Shops Pyramid in Memphis, Tennessee, along the um, uh, Mississippi River. This was the first time I ever went to Arkansas, which was to make this photograph to cross the river. I literally had an Uber driver drop me off on the side of the freeway, and then I walked through like a farmer's cornfield and went and photographed this on the banks. Uh, this one is a um, retired entrepreneur. He's a garage door magnate in Chicago uh, named uh, Jim Onan. So this is Onan's Golden Pyramid, which is now actually a black pyramid because it burned down and he rebuilt it. Uh, it previously had been one of the largest sort of clad in, uh, what is it? Yeah, clad in 24 karat gold. Uh, so I guess he couldn't afford to, to replace that part of it. Um, this is a um, fundamentalist Church of Latter-day Saints Mormon temple in southern Utah, kind of near the Nevada border. Uh, and this one is a data center. It previously had been a uh, high-end furniture design studio um, by the Steelcase Corporation and then was sold at a great loss and is now a, a heavily a military, militarized data center. And so as I was working on this project, it started to kind of fill in, in my mind, this kind of uh, patchwork of various aspects of American kind of capitalist culture, um, thinking about the sort of religious side and the familial side and the home ownership side and the 
militaristic side, um, there's a number of uh, military installations that are pyramids, there's a number of government centers that are pyramids, um, a number of sort of retail environments and industrial environments, and it just kept kind of going from there. Uh, this one has been recently demolished. This was actually in Sierra Madre, um, not that far from here. Uh, and then the project has extended um, beyond the U.S. borders, and that's kind of just happened in the last year and a half. Um, this one is one that I visited somewhat recently back in May. It's a uh, Walmart, obviously, um, in eastern Vancouver. And as I was working on this, I kind of started to thinking about like what it might mean to make a, um, you know, a sort of religious, spiritual pilgrimage along the lines of kind of thinking about the uh, St. James Trail in uh, northern Spain, or thinking about making the Hajj, or visiting these other uh, sacred sites that people have made pilgrimages to, Sedona, Arizona for that matter as well, and what that might look like in a sort of capitalist mentality of traveling these various sort of like energetic kind of vortex sites that kind of relate to this sort of uh, network of uh, capitalist philosophy. Um, the images have existed in a few different ways, kind of like we saw there was a wall print of the one from Sacramento. Uh, in their recent incarnation, um, they've, I've been putting them in these aluminum uh, frames and they essentially are sized to be contact prints. Um, they're all, for the most part, shot with a 4x5 film camera. Uh, I wind up traveling to these places for uh, a few days or sometimes up to a week. Um, so there's a writing component as well, and I wind up sort of testing out other ways um, that this project kind of manifests. This is a former water park. I've now been doing this long enough that some of these are getting demolished. This is a former water park in Redlands. Uh, this one is a um, nuclear missile radar station uh, that has been decommissioned in northern North Dakota, the Luxor. Uh, and this is the uh, Buddha Maitreya Shambhala Monastery in Clear Lake, California, uh, which is run by a, a gentleman who uh, fashions himself to be the um, second coming of Jesus, as well as uh, the reoccurrence of Krishna, as well as the prophesied medicine Buddha. He sort of exists as all of the uh, avatars. And then the last thing I wanted to show um, just to kind of finish this off, then we can talk. Um, most recently, as part of this project, I'm really not good with this track though. Mm -hmm. There we go. Uh, most recently, as part of this project, I've been working on a 16 millimeter film uh, around this topic. Uh, so this, the film is still in production. I think it's going to be about a half hour long. Uh, so this is a small excerpt from it, um, focused on that uh, nuclear missile uh, location we just saw, the Mickelson Safeguard Complex, which is in Nakoma, North Dakota. And it uh, had been built in the 1970s with the purpose of being able to intercept nuclear missiles coming across the um, North Pole from the Soviet Union. Um, by the time it was complete and it was built out of so much concrete and rebar that it was meant to be able to take a direct nuclear strike and people in North Dakota like to joke that uh, North Dakota was like the fourth most powerful nuclear power in the world in the 1970s. There's so many missile silos out there and there are missile silos surrounding this place. Um, but because it fell uh, behind the technology so quickly, uh, it was decommissioned about nine months into its operation.
Great. Thank you all. So I want to start out with, I think this is one of the big questions that I asked you when I came. You had some open studios. Yeah, 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 back in July. Yeah, and I wanted to ask you again for the people, but also because, you know, answers change, you know. But I was really curious as to what proportion of your interest in these, um, these themes is more of a kind of like anthropological, mm -hmm. ironic versus believer, sincere kind of, um, you know, interest. Yeah, I mean, it's a question that um, comes up a lot. Um, do we do we need to worry about this? Can you hear us back there? <coughs> so my like cough okay. doesn't just stop working too, so I'm gonna cough a bit. Um, I feel like that question comes up with this work a lot, and uh, it's interesting to me because I feel like it's like I hate to sort of like talk about having like a toe dipped into both sides, but I think and again it kind of came out of doing the radio show and having a background in journalism. I think from my art background, um, I very much come from a place of like wanting like primary experiences and like primary research uh, as a way to kind of inform the work that I'm making. And so a lot of this came out of like wanting to go talk to these practitioners and also wanting to go sort of like have these experiences. <coughs> like in the case of the Buddha Maitreya uh, monastery. And so it's like the space of like trying to, <coughs> wow. You want some water? <laughs> I'm gonna need a new tea. Um, trying to basically understand a space and take in that information and then think about essentially how to process it. Uh huh. Um, so it's like, it's kind of a mixture. And like in meeting the, uh, some of these musicians I'm talking about, they had these kind of religious, so spiritual practices that were very kind of cobbled together, but were also like not fully serious. And so that was really interesting to see someone I mean, I don't know, I grew up like Catholic, for example, and there was a very um, regimented way that uh, Catholicism obviously functions, and that was something I like, ran away from from a young age. And so seeing people having their uh, metaphysical practices and their like, belief system like, in a constant state of evolution was really interesting to me. Um, I also think that like, I'm very, um, very like, confident in like, acknowledging that I don't know everything and using that as like a place of exploration and also like sitting comfortably with the unknown and with the sort of like ability to kind of comprehend that like human knowledge is still expanding and our understanding of the universe is still expanding, our understanding of um, how sort of like electrons move through a slit under observation is still, uh, you know, a work in progress. Um, so allowing myself, I guess, to be open to all these possibilities that Thank people, you. oh my god, thank you. Nice. Um, people uh, were positing and just allowing that stuff to sort of be this kind of like content and, um, you know, sort of like production that would exist in the work. Um, yeah, that makes sense. And I forget if we talked about whether, I forget if you told me that you were raised Catholic because I was going to ask also if you were raised in a spiritual or religious home. Catholicism is also like so varied in the experiences mm -hmm. of it's such a big religion, first of all. And some people are um, very religious but not spiritual at all. Some people are very spiritual in that religion and usually also religious. It's pretty <coughs> religious religion, but um, but you know, like you have mystics and you have um, all sorts of people. Um, but it's just it's interesting because. You went to CalArts, I went to CalArts, and like, I remember from that school um, that one of the things that I learned there was, um, I mean, it's, it's, it's a lot of big words, but it's actually a pretty simple idea, that the sort of problem with spirituality from a sort of postmodern art school mm -hmm. consideration or perspective is that it relies on essentialism, which is essentially the idea that like, you can have a symbol that doesn't need a context. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? That you can have a truth that doesn't need a context. Mm -hmm. And that's sort of like 
the opposite of like what most postmodern political theory or political looking at art. And I don't really know where I'm going with this, but it's just sort of interesting to me because your work kind of skirts the line of that a little mm -hmm. bit. Because it's not really, um, you know, it's not uh, a manifesto on any sort of spiritual perspective, mm -hmm. but it's certainly not totally like cynical either. You know what I mean? There seems to be like a lot of probably because you talk about all these primary experiences, which I'm assuming meaning you go and you talk to those people directly. Yeah, That's go to the means. site, go talk to people. In the case of like the uh, the photographs from Nakoma, like I went and basically stayed there for a week and met the townspeople and got to know them, primarily as a way to get onto the site, but also to know the history better and the um, kind of like vibe of the <coughs> town and that kind of um, Yeah, it's a lot of work just to make fun of something. Yeah. <laughs> um, okay, so... Well, like, also, that like, kind of tacking onto that, I think one thing I wanted to, um, I was thinking about, and so, like, meeting some of these New Age musicians, for example, um, there was an element that reminded me of how an art practice is constructed, mm -hmm. and that, like, artists, in a lot of ways, become their own sort of shamans, they become their own kind of, uh, you know, sort of, like, snake oil hucksters, in a way, and that was always really interesting to me, of how through kind of creating like a constellation of art objects that are all meant to kind of exist in a sort of linkage and a timeline with each other and you know sort of putting this as a kind of argument together it becomes this um, thing that you're sort of like putting out to an audience and people can decide the you know uh, whether you are full of it or mm -hmm. not and that becomes kind of part of how that all functions so like very much in studying some of this um, this kind of subculture it made me think a lot about how contemporary art works as well. Yeah, and also when you think about it, I mean, um, being a contemporary artist is kind of like a ludicrous idea that takes a lot of faith, right? Mm -hmm. Essentially, because you have no idea what's going to happen and there are no guarantees and how are you supposed to make a life out of this? Which, if you look at like, for instance, like old biblical parables, it's always these people going on these huge journeys that really don't make any sense, and they have no idea how they're going to succeed in whatever mission that they have. Yeah. So there's a lot of sort of like um, um, similarities just in the sense of, oh, see, very charitable. Oh my thank you. <laughs> <laughs> um, there's a lot of uh, parallels in the sense of things that don't necessarily make practical sense and require a lot of energy for totally indeterminate um, achievements. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And it's like the, the sort of terror and vulnerability of that um, as an artist, and uh, I think a lot of people can relate to this, is also kind of where it's really exciting. It's kind of like, you know, facing the void, dealing mm -hmm. with the uncanny, kind of mm -hmm. jumping off into the... Uh, to the unknown. Um, I mean, making some of this work has required me to go to some places that I didn't totally feel comfortable going. Um, the pyramid that I shot photographs in Southern Utah, which is a, a fundamentalist church of Latter-day Saints, um, they're kind of an exiled group. Uh, they have a lot of um, sort of French beliefs, even for Mormonism. Uh, one of their beliefs is that Adam from the Adam and Eve tale is God. He's like the human embodiment of God because he was the first human. There's also some murder-related uh, things that are sort of part of their lineage and power struggles. It's very kind of like, if you ever saw that HBO show, Big Love, there's some very, some very similar storylines. Um, and so I was kind of going there at five in the morning and meeting somebody and uh, it was kind of freaky. Um, everyone that I was initially kind of freaked out about from the outside has been incredibly warm to me and amazing. <clears throat> but it's all to say, yeah, there's been some risk involved. Um, this is just for my own curiosity, but are you, um, I've just been watching Encounters on Netflix. So have you thought at all about incorporating like UFO, I don't know, you know some other stuff, metaphysical maybe, beams of light. Yeah, I mean, I guess I think about that from the relationship of thinking about like consciousness existing on these uh, subatomic particles. And um, so I think about that and I take sort of someone like Yasos uh, at face value when he's telling me he's encountered in, in uh, habitual dialogue with uh, interdimensional beings. But, um, but I don't know. It's, 
it's funny, it's like there's all the work that you want to make and, all, and there's like the much smaller subsection of the work you're like capable of making given the mm -hmm. amount of time and energy you have. Um, so I don't know if it enters into it at a certain point, uh, I would consider that, but it's kind of funny, like now having done this pyramid project for about eight years, um, people send me pyramid locations all the time on Instagram and through email and stuff and I almost start to feel like this like project that like now owns you in a way like the pyramids are this like albatross around my neck and this thing I'm like sort of trying to complete but there's always more and more and more and more and more um, and I'm, I'm making a book with uh, Josh and White of the fulcrum of this um, of these photographs but it also just feels like this thing that's almost like bigger than me and that was also like always one of the things that was really attractive to me I guess about producing an archive in some ways, it's this kind of fool's errand that you know, kind of like how Flusser was sort of talking about. He's sort of talking about the, one of the things that people are attracted to about photography is that you can continue to produce images that kind of go into this image stream, and you never can satisfy all the sort of like desire for images. So it becomes this thing that you can endlessly like you know throw into like the sort of well, but also it becomes like impossible for you to sort of satisfy your own desire in this way. So it's like this twin kind of like Sisyphean situation. Um, and so I don't know, it feels a little bit like I'm this almost like mechanic working uh, in the sort of like factory of like generating um, pyramid images in this case. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, that brings me to another, another thing I wanted to ask you, which is it has to do with the way you make images I mean, one thing that's really interesting about your work is that I associate New Age imagery with a lot of cheesiness, mm -hmm. you know? It's sort of like uh, the production values of like The Secret or, you know, something sure. like yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. And it's almost like it's so bad it's good, you know? Like the kind of like, it's like ironic fashion or something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But your images, I wouldn't call them so bad it's good. I mean, I feel like you use a lot of like sophisticated I, you know, when I see something of yours, if there's something that looks cheesy, it looks very intentionally cheesy mm -hmm. because it's usually contrasted by something that looks pretty slick. Yeah. You know, and I was just wondering what your thought process is building that tension. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, um, I do have a, it's funny, like always trying to articulate what all your interests and where they lie are. I'm very interested in vernacular imagery and a lot of the sort of research content that's led to this work, this kind of archive I keep referring to, it's very like provisional imagery. They're like studio photographs often um, for the kind of product-y stuff, but oftentimes, you know, they're not very high-end. There's a sort of like low-end, uh, low technique to them. And so in trying to restage them was also trying to kind of replicate that failure to a degree, mm -hmm. but my failures would be different from their failures and that kind of thing. And then in thinking about some of these pyramid sites in this case, um, one of the things that kind of led to my thinking about this uh, project before I had sort of conceptualized it is when I got out of grad school, I worked for this pretty horrendous uh, production company in Culver City, and at one point I took like a FedEx package in that needed to be overnighted to a photographer in New York, so it was like a hard drive, and at the little like FedEx like kiosk there, they uh, had like off to the side of the, um, of the sort of retail counter photograph of like the FedEx headquarters in Memphis and it was like this photograph made of the sort of like FedEx kind of like mothership which I thought was so amazing to kind of you know think about being at the branch office and maybe you're like a new like FedEx employee and you're like one day one day I'll get there <laughs> and at the same time the image was made in kind of like you know high noon like broad daylight you know the grass wasn't cut like it was middle of the summer so the light was super harsh and so it was this weird thing of like it's this like honorific image, but also it fails to sort of perform that in so many different ways because of like, you know, sort of technical and whatever failures. And so I was very much kind of thinking about that with these like pyramid pictures, and I would do a lot of research to see how other people have taken, taken photos of these, because, you know, probably it comes as no surprise that there's a bunch of uh, nerdy pyramid enthusiasts out there. And so I would see how other people have taken these pictures and use that oftentimes as a kind of model um, for how I might approach it. And so that kind of like attempt to be like honorific, but also have it like fail, is definitely like a sort of ground I'm trying to find. And it's it's interesting. Like I'll have studio visits with people, and they'll come see some of this work. And sometimes they're like, oh, like this one really looks like aliens are ready to come down, or it's some kind of interdimensional channel. 
and then uh, other people would be like, you know, I kind of thought you would like make it more glorious looking, you know what I mean? So, uh, I don't know, that failure is like definitely something I'm sort of striving for. Um, yeah, it's really subjective mm -hmm. when it comes to that kind of stuff. Um, it's funny, it actually does surprise me that there's a niche group of people going around photographing pyramids. Yeah. But that's just me. And I've been sent these maps from people, and uh, there are a few websites that are very kind of like Geo Cities, Angel Fire, uh, late 90s, early 2000s era, where people are just listing these pyramids with like a you know JPEG that's like 26 kilobytes next to it. <laughs> it's amazing. It's really amazing. <laughs> I yeah. wish I could find ways to integrate all of this stuff into it, because it's really beautiful. Yeah, well, that's sort of where that question about the like about the like the essentialism question came up. Mm -hmm. Is that specifically with pyramids? Like, do you ever find yourself speculating why pyramids? Or like, I don't know. Do you ever think about that? Just pyramid, pyramid, pyramid. Why? Are like, so why they pyramids? are? Uh, why they are so important? Not like, why did you cho choose them? But yeah. why are they so repeated? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it would be impossible not to speculate on that. For sure. Yeah. I mean, it's obviously this this form that is repeated since antiquity and something that human beings feel attracted to for all these reasons. I don't know if it's just because it's pointy or if um, it sort of does exist as this kind of like energetic channel. Like for example, it's been interesting, this, um, this friend of uh, Evan Walsh and I who's here, um, uh, Chris McElrath, who is a high-end uh, fine art photo printer, he and I were making one of these as a, as a print for somebody. Um, he, we were looking at test prints over the course of a series of weeks, and at one point I came in to like look at the final of him, and he's like, I just can't stop looking at it. It's like, it's just like it calls to me. <laughs> and so I don't know, I kind of feel like there are these sort of primal uh, codes that um, hit our brains in various ways that are hard to sort of qualify, so maybe the pyramid is functioning that way. Yeah, and it would also be hard to even know what the meaning of that would be. Like why it would yeah. hit your brain in a certain way. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, even yeah. if it did do that, there could be an infinite number of reasons that yeah. it wouldn't necessarily, it would be speculative. Well, and there's like, you know, I'm definitely interested in uh, absurdity and, and failure to a certain degree. So where these buildings have been built to kind of satisfy, like for example, in um, Tempe, Arizona, there's a inverted pyramid that is a city hall. Um, there are others, you know, built like there's the basketball arena in, um, in Long Beach. There's the arena that is um, the Bass Pro Shops that had previously, previously been an NBA arena. Like the certain ways that the uh, icon of the pyramid like satisfies this thing for human beings, but like as an architectural kind of like entity, they're like an extremely wasteful sort of they like are. amount of space. Yeah. Um, they don't sort of like perform in the way that uh, a boxing building obviously would perform. That, so that sphere. It's yeah. Like wild, yeah, yeah, yeah. But yeah. Um, yeah, I think it's probably a good time for us to open it up to any questions that any of y'all might have. Don't be shy. Okay, yeah, you're good. I'm wondering about um, so collecting, you know, list of, you collect a lot of stuff. <laughs> you collect the, the archive of prosthetics. Yeah. The pyramids, the gurus, silos, music, the VR piece was a collection of art, as I recall. It's, a, it's like it's a uh, an action of the folder on my hard drive that was the sort of photographic research of all this stuff. And then the coins, the collectibles. So I'm, I'm wondering about the the impulse to collect. Mm -hmm. Where does that come from for you? It's a good question. I mean. I mean, I think even just being a photographer, uh, you wind up basically having collections as a result. You know, you're like making lots of photographs, they go in boxes, the negatives go in binders, um, the images go on hard drives. From working in commercial photography, things would get sectioned off uh, into different kind of like file formats and file sizes um, in all these different ways. So, I mean, I think there's like the collection aspect, but I think there's also like maybe from a even going further, it's about sort of like categorization as a way to kind of understand something. And I think we see like this, you know, impulse that humans have to sort of like categorize everything as a way to sort of like make sense of our environment, um, as a way to sort of understand something. Um, as somebody that uh, has been, you know, sort of thinks of themselves as a photographer, but also like 
makes photographs exist in these other ways, like that at times have been confusing to how people want to sort of like slot what it is that you do. And so as far as like my collection of things, I guess it's sort of is along those lines. It's like I also have like a record collection. I have a very sort of like organized like um, series of folders on my computer devoted to sort of like artists and art movements and that kind of thing. Uh, I've never really thought about myself as a collector. And I do tend to like to get rid of stuff, but I don't know. I guess this is the collections that I'm into. Instead of getting into stamps or like fine whiskey, <laughs> I got into pyramids. <laughs> and there's um, all those like posters, and um, I really loved those images. I mean, I kind of like the cheesiness of New Age imagery. Mm -hmm. Like I'm into it aesthetically, yeah. unironically. I'm clearly a fan too. And um, it's funny because you were talking about like the wise people, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? They look so wise and calm. But it's <coughs> funny because whenever I like listen to like, I, I do all that stuff, like I listen to like the climate, like the 483 hertz or whatever. Mm -hmm. 432. Yeah, whatever. You know what I mean? Like they're always telling you some hertz is going to like change your life. But, um, and like I always believe it. Like every time I see a calm face on there, I'm like, that's how I'm going to feel. It works. Yeah, well, I guess like there's that for me, but I really and you know I kind of describe this as you know thinking about conceptual photography and thinking about commercial photography and also just thinking about um, like structuralism and post-structuralism and the denotated and the connotated within a sort of sign and symbol is like for those those images of that like that wiseness and that calmness there was this like thing of like just thinking about like affect and gesture and how you sort of like <laughs> demonstrate to somebody that you're wise and calm. Yeah, and then you know why you would be attracted to that. Again, it almost kind of goes back to this like idea of like being a huckster, or being a shaman. There's this. I mean, I highly recommend everyone should go at some point. There's this convention that happens, uh, the LAX Hilton. Um, usually, it's around like Valentine's Day. Um, it's called the Conscious Life Expo. And it's a four-day thing. It starts on like a Thursday and ends on a Sunday. Um, and it's a lot of these people all kind of coming together. And it really is a sort of like catch-all. Unfortunately, you know, as we've kind of seen uh, in our sort of like post-Trump world, there's been a space where people like almost like uber kind of like hippie metaphysical uh, kind of new age uh, and you know whatever folks have found a way to kind of connect with the sort of conspiracy theorists of the right and the back. And so unfortunately, in the back of the sort of political spectrum, so there is a little bit of that there, unfortunately, but it's like people making these kind of um, sort of health and healing devices meant to help your body or help you meditate. There's also lots of seminars around kind of like UFO encounters or ancient aliens or the ancient sort of like builders of uh, the megaliths and all this kind of uh, stuff. and. A lot of this, like aesthetics, like I've gone there as research, basically, um, all sort of happened there across a long, interesting weekend. So, you mentioned the conceptual commercial. Are you mm -hmm. trying to kind of tie that? Because you know, there's like the stock photography mm -hmm. and like selling artwork as well, mm -hmm. um, and then with the you know the photography of like you know commercial electronics. You talked a little bit about that. Mm -hmm. Is that a conscious thing for you to, would you mass produce your stuff? Would you, you, know, you mentioned working at, um, like as a mechanic. Yeah. Would you, would you want to stimulate that more within the, like the, the dissolution of that, of that barrier? Well, it's funny, like there's kind of two ways I sort of think about that question. Um, one of them is like, as I started to cast people from uh, casting services for these pictures, a lot of them would comment to me, they would be like, oh, that's where like working in the studio, you know, I've got the studio light set up and uh, I'm making these custom backdrops and things. Um, and they are sort of commenting that like, I'm basically performing this e-commerce type of photography of which they're very used to and getting hired to do all the time. So it's kind of like, well, why are you making this in this art object that nobody wants? <laughs> why don't you just go work for, um, why don't you go work for a company and like shoot these devices for real or shoot sweatpants for real? Or, yeah, just do the thing. <laughs> Allow yourself to get sort of like absorbed like into the, uh, the mechanism. And so that was like always this weird thing where I felt like I was kind of working in parallel. Like prior to starting down this sort of path of making the work I showed, because um, I did have this like, 
experience working at a, um, as a, at a stock photography company, and we were actually going on photo shoots and remaking stock images for the collection, uh, there was this like space where I then wanted to make, and this is after a few years later after graduate school, where I wanted to remake stock photographs. And I was collecting all these um, stock catalogs that had existed in the 80s and 90s, and initially asking friends to sort of restage this thing and thinking I could build out this sort of like collection and build out this archive. And it would obviously be this like impossible task that like no one person could do alone. Um, I don't know if I could do it, like actually just kind of like join the sort of dark side, so to speak, and go shoot this stuff. Um, I worked in commercial photography for a little while as like a digital tech and an assistant and things, and like didn't love doing that, so I have this weird sort of relationship to it. Um, I guess I didn't mean doing that literally, but mm -hmm. applying the, um, you mentioned making the coins and stuff, like, yeah. even, um, like selling a calendar as a product. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, just like kind of thinking about that. Yeah, yeah, I don't know. I don't know. I mean, those editions, for example, like the coins are an edition of like 100, and the calendar was like an edition of like 30. Um, if they were to get mass produced, like a cause doll or something like that, like I don't know. <laughs> I've not been presented with that type of an opportunity. I don't really see, um, I mean part of the, what's been sort of weird about making this work too is I'm sort of dealing with such a uh, narrow kind of like time period, a narrow maybe like, uh, like it takes a lot to sort of understand maybe what's going on with the work. So maybe that isn't in the cards and you need to simplify it more to make a more pop cultural icon. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I appreciate that. Yeah, I don't know if I answered your question. <laughs> no, I mean, I just kind of, I was, uh, was interested in the, um, the kind of cross-pollination between the different kinds of images and the different kinds of images. Because it's like, because artwork is commercial, right? It mm -hmm. can be commercial on some level. So like, there's like, you know, mentioning like the FedEx building picture, it's like not pretty, but it's like, you know, um, that's like as commercial as, you know, anything that's very beautiful. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, I mean, in this case, too, and it sort of opens up this question of thinking about, like, an industrial image, like an image that's being used for a particular purpose. It's like, it has its aesthetic, but it's also being used as a sort of more direct informational device. And those types of pictures are really interesting to me, kind of like images that come out of, like, textbooks for, you know, science or uh, biology or what have you, or images that are made for industry, for, like, real estate or that kind of thing. Like, images I've pulled from Zillow and Craigslist and all this kind of stuff have been really exciting and the thinking behind the work. I think there was one in the back that... One in the back back there. I, I like what was mentioned about um, how profits were going on journeys at one point, and the, the artistic experience of asking a question and making a body of work. Then there's uh, similarities of crossover there. Mm -hmm. And I'm curious uh, for you, considering it looks like a lot of your practices so involved like going out into the field and spending time, I mean, you're walking through you know, marshes and stuff to get photos, like, mm -hmm. where is, do you ever see your practice getting to a place where you're just going and experiencing these things and not documenting anything, but just almost absorbing it yourself into this conscious space and the reason why I ask that is because it seems like a lot of what we do consider religion is just something that's evolved to a place of becoming an icon and becoming a symbol. And the more that we document things, we are just kind of recycling, going back to the system of creating more iconography and images. Um, I wonder where the line is drawn at where we can just exist with this experience that we're chasing, essentially. Yeah, I mean, there's an absurdism to these kind of pilgrimages I'm making to go to these places, because oftentimes the result is one picture, and I'm obviously making a lot of mm -hmm. photographs, and I started working on this film about a year ago, so there's this sort of film component. Um, but it feels like a lot of great sort of like effort and expense to go to these places and to spend time there. And so it does feel like the, the image is this kind of byproduct that's obviously part of my interest in the practice, but there is this sort of 
journey and time spent there uh, that very much is kind of addressing like what you're talking about essentially of having this um, this experience and having this kind of like energetic sort of relationship. One of the reasons I've gone back to this place in, in uh, North Dakota a few times is it had this really sort of like, like I really, kind of in the way that Dick Sutton in the beginning of the, um, the lecture uh, was talking about these sort of vortex energy, like it really felt like that from this space. Um, and that was really like sort of powerful in a way. I also, um, prior to sort of doing this work, have kind of had a, I guess, a history of doing what you're talking about, of basically wandering and going out to places um, without really knowing what the purpose is. And oftentimes, you know, I'd be taking a camera and maybe taking some pictures and things, but it is and was a sort of attempt to have these kind of primary experiences uh, without being front loaded with like what I anticipated would happen there. And it's led into these classes that I've taught uh, at Otis. One was based um, primarily in sites around LA. And then from there, another faculty and I initially, Chris Badger, who's a sculptor that has a, a fantastic show up right now at Santa Monica College. Uh, he and I created this class called Wilderness is Myth and Metaphor. Uh, and then when he left Otis, uh, Aurora Tang and I started teaching it together. And it was this class where we would take a group of students essentially on this Mobius strip uh, path uh, between here and the northern Utah and come back for the course of like six or seven days. And a lot of that was not only trying to do that um, for ourselves, because I still was very much participating in the journey, but also kind of give that as a, a thing to other people as a practice to kind of encourage. Um, so I'm very invested in that thing that you're, you're talking about, and I think it's an important thing to sort of run towards uh, the excitement of mystery and vulnerability and the unknown. I think we have time for one more question. Evan, Phil, you guys want to throw more Maybe two of y'all can do it really fast, really fast. <laughs> Thank you guys, yeah, thanks, it's really nice. Um, I was thinking that every artist has a relationship, a triad between artwork, artist, and viewer. Mm -hmm. But then you have this interesting triad because you made something matter of like the new age. You have these other people, members, worshippers, happy, right? And I really enjoyed hearing all these words that were being used to describe what you do is with faith. Mm -hmm. It's really interesting. And then you described the um, fool's errand of being an artist, the Sisyphean process or Sisyphean act of experience. Mm -hmm. And then you talk about Fusser and um, you know, how it talks about the functionary and kind of the myth around that or the, the, the lack of consciousness as a functionary. And it made me think that, um, and I never thought about this about continuing to work, but cruel optimism mm -hmm. is so, I think, important for so many people or so many positions in that triad. Know, like that attachment we have to something, yeah, and knowing that, that thing is going to betray that attachment, yeah, you know, but we still sustain ourselves in relation to that thing that we're attached to, mm -hmm. and it's completely absurd. I remember, like, uh, when I was making some of these pyramid pictures, I'd come back to um, Las Vegas, I'd flown up to fly to North Dakota because it's hard to fly to North Dakota, and then was getting my car back and was then going to drive to these other sites in Arizona. And I was explaining what I was doing to this cab driver, and he was kind of, because he'd asked me what I was up to, and he was like, well, is someone paying you to do this? And I was like, no. And he was like, do you have the uh, intention at one point to make money from it? And I was like, maybe. And he's like, well, why would you do it then? And so it is this like weird uh, thing. And he had confessed that he had been a dancer, and that he'd give, given up dancing because it was just like there's no money in it, so he was now a, Uber driver and was trying to sort of make it in uh, Las Vegas in one form or another. But I think that is this like weird thing that we do to ourselves as artists where we're sort of participating in this thing. I mean, I think what makes artists kind of like, um, as much as I like to think about artists being another kind of like genre of worker as we sort of like exist within the sort of fabric of society, there is this other kind of like absurdist part of the entire endeavor where it's like this, um, this fulfillment question, where it's kind of like, is there an external fulfillment that's coming in? Is there an internal fulfillment? What is the sort of like ratio and relationship between the two? Um, obviously, if both collapse, then the artistic practice collapses, but it essentially becomes this like, again, maybe like fool's errand or a sort of life path that um, is, I guess, different in how uh, validation is, is granted. 
So, I guess the, the thing that I'm noticing as I'm like looking at this whole body of images and thinking of everything is that you're choosing and working with this form of the pyramid, but there aren't any images of ziggurats or of the ancient pyramids of Giza, and it's very rooted in the modern built environment. And I wonder if you could talk about how you like came upon that or like what it is about this like built environment investigation that's different from the kind of like core spiritual shape. Yeah, I mean the Sacramento uh, pyramid is a ziggurat, and there's an occasional ziggurat here and there, and sometimes I, I there's mean, like excuse a. Excuse me, I mean like uh, Mayan pyramids. For sure. Like, oh, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I mean it's it's funny. Like I, I guess because I felt like the way that I was encountering these pyramids as they existed in this these kind of new age cultural artifacts, records, tapes, magazines, pamphlets, whatever, um, that there was this sort of like neo approach to it. And that as much as people might be referencing the uh, Mesoamerican pyramids, or they might be referencing the pyramids in Egypt or elsewhere, there is also this, like, I don't know. And this is definitely true of the New Age movement, where it's essentially kind of like cobbling together in like a chosen kind of patchwork all the stuff it wants to pull from Eastern philosophy and, um, and sort of like Western sort of like uh, indigenous kind of cultures and all this other thing. And so the pyramids in this case, at least in the ones I've been choosing to photograph, felt very much like this, you know, a very kind of like Las Vegas sort of approach of like taking this antiquated architectural form, like dumping out all of the reasons why it existed in the past and what the sort of cultural kind of legacy was there, and then, you know, building it out of sort of, you know, wooden studs and, uh, you know, very cheap kind of building materials, and then filling it up with all this kind of like American kind like culture and, and virtue and so it, and pretty much all the ones I have photographed are post-war pyramids there is one that I have photographed that's in eastern Pennsylvania that was built by some Rosicrucians um, after the Revolutionary War and still stands but most of them are um, very new and also like as a result don't seem to last very long and so that was a really like interesting kind of like facet for me to, to focus on was to think about um, I guess this sort of like emptying out and this sort of copy of a copy and this sort of like replication facade and also the kind of short, intentionally almost short time period that these places would last. I, I guess the quick follow up, forgive me, is I guess that seems to me like a metaphor for image making, mm -hmm. right? Like the pyramid is a vessel without the, like, the content. Mm -hmm. Is that something that you think about in terms of image making as well? Well, I do think about like that images are these. Um, sort of flawed communication devices, and that it, an image never really tells you why it was made or what the photographer's intention is, and so it has to sort of travel along with some form of context, you know, a person that explains it, a caption, a brochure, a newspaper, you know, article paired with it, and so without that, then this, this sort of like, you know, this image, this thing that's so indexical and ex can sort of show the viewer so many things that you can sort of like glob on with your sort of assumptions and your sort of knowledge base from your life also at the same time like doesn't explain its like reason to exist. So I think there's certain elements maybe of the pyramid photographs in that too. Like really I mean this kind of started as a like why do these things exist and where are they? Um, and so yeah maybe there's a verisimilitude between those two things. Alright, well I think that's a good place for us to end. Um, be sure to check out, it's closed now, but come back and check out the exhibition, It's About Time, um, across the way, and uh, feel free to grab pastries and tea and water on your way out, and let's all thank Ian again, of course.